Virginia Woolf, The Short Stories Adeline Virginia Woolf was born in 1882 and was to become a founder of modernist writing. Her background is filled with elements of tragedy that she somehow overcame to become a revered writer. Her mother died when she was 13, her half-sister Stella two years later, and with it her first of several nervous breakdowns. She began writing professionally at age 20, but her father's death two years later brought a complete mental collapse and she was briefly institutionalised. Three of her half-brothers had sexually abused her, so further darkness was added to her life. But out of this came great innovations in writing. She was a pioneer of stream of consciousness. Whilst the dark periods continued to interrupt her emotional state, her rate of work never ceased. Until, on March the 28th, 1941, Wolfe put on her overcoat, filled its pocket with stones and walked into the River Ouse and drowned herself, leaving behind a note which read in part, Dearest, I feel as certain that I am going mad again. I feel we can't go through another of these terrible times. And I shan't recover this time. I begin to hear voices and I can't concentrate so I'm doing what seems the best thing to do. In this volume, we concentrate on her short stories that help to illuminate her rich talents. They are read for you by Richard Mitchley and Gisela Rowe. An Unwritten Novel by Virginia Woolf Such an expression of unhappiness was enough by itself to make one's eyes slide above the paper's edge to the poor woman's face insignificant without that look, almost a symbol of human destiny with it. Life's what you see in people's eyes. Life's what they learn, and having learnt it, never, though they seek to hide it, cease to be aware of. What? That life's like that, it seems. Five faces opposite, five mature faces, and the knowledge in each face. Strange, though, how people want to conceal it, Marks of reticence are on all those faces. Lips shut, eyes shaded, each one of the five doing something to hide or stultify his knowledge. One smokes, another reads, a third checks entries in a pocket book, a fourth stares at the map of the line framed opposite. And the fifth? The terrible thing about the fifth is that she does nothing at all. She looks at life. Ah, but my poor unfortunate woman... Do play the game. Do, for all our sakes, conceal it. As if she heard me, she looked up, shifted slightly in her seat and sighed. She seemed to apologise, and at the same time to say to me, If only you knew. Then she looked at life again. But I do know, I answered silently, glancing at the times for manner's sake. I know the whole business. Peace between Germany and the Allied powers was yesterday officially ushered in at Paris. Signor Nitti, the Italian Prime Minister. A passenger train at Doncaster was in collision with a goods train. We all know. The Times knows. But we pretend we don't. My eyes had once more crept over the paper's rim. She shuddered, twitched her arm queerly to the middle of her back and shook her head. Again I dipped into my great reservoir of life. Take what you like, I continued. Births, deaths, marriages, court circular, the habits of birds, Leonardo da Vinci, the Sand Hills murder, high wages and the cost of living. Oh, take what you like, I repeated. It's all in the times. Again, with infinite weariness, she moved her head from side to side until, like a top exhausted with spinning, it settled on her neck. The times was no protection against such sorrow as hers but other human beings forbade intercourse. The best thing to do against life was to fold the paper so that it made a perfect square, crisp, thick, impervious even to life. This done, I glanced up quickly, armed with a shield of my own. She pierced through my shield. She gazed into my eyes as if searching any sediment of courage at the depths of them and damping it to clay. Her twitch alone denied all hope, discounted all illusion. So we rattled through Surrey and across the border into Sussex. But with my eyes upon life, 
I did not see that the other travellers had left one by one, till save for the man who read, we were alone together. Here was Three Bridges Station. We drew slowly down the platform and stopped. Was he going to leave us? I prayed both ways. I prayed last that he might stay. At that instant he roused himself, crumpled his paper contemptuously like a thing done with, burst open the door and left us alone. The unhappy woman, leaning a little forward, palely and colourlessly, addressed me. Talked of stations and holidays, of brothers at Eastbourne, and the time of year, which was, I forget now, early or late. But at last, looking from the window and seeing I knew only life, she breathed, Staying away, that's the drawback of it. Ah, now we approach the catastrophe. My sister-in-law... The bitterness of her tone was like lemon on cold steel, and speaking not to me but to herself, she muttered, Nonsense, she would say. That's what they all say. And while she spoke, she fidgeted as though the skin on her back were as a plucked fowl's in a poultry shop window. Oh, that cow, she broke off nervously, as though the great wooden cow in the meadow had shocked her and saved her from some indiscretion. Then she shuddered, and then she made the awkward angular movement that I had seen before, as if, after the spasm, some spot between the shoulders burnt or itched. Then again she looked the most unhappy woman in the world, and I once more reproached her, though not with the same conviction, for if there were a reason, and if I knew the reason, the stigma was removed from life. Sisters-in-law, I said. Her lips pursed as if to spit venom at the word, Pursed they remained. All she did was to take her glove and rub hard at a spot on the window pane. She rubbed as if she would rub something out forever, some stain, some indelible contamination. Indeed, the spot remained for all her rubbing, and back she sank with the shudder and the clutch of the arm I had come to expect. Something impelled me to take my glove and rub my window. There, too, was a little speck on the glass. For all my rubbing, it remained. And then the spasm went through me. I crooked my arm and plucked at the middle of my back. My skin, too, felt like the damp chicken skin in the poultry shop window. One spot between the shoulders itched and irritated, felt clammy, felt raw. Could I reach it? Surreptitiously, I tried. She saw me. A smile of infinite irony, infinite sorrow, flitted and faded from her face but she had communicated, shared her secret, passed her poison. She would speak no more. Leaning back in my corner, shielding my eyes from her eyes, seeing only the slopes and hollows, greys and purples of the winter's landscape, I read her message, deciphered her secret, reading it beneath her gaze. Hilda's the sister-in-law. Hilda? Hilda? Hilda Marsh. Hilda the blooming, the full-bosomed, the matronly. Hilda stands at the door as the cab draws up, holding a coin. Poor Minnie, more of a grasshopper than ever. Old cloak she had last year. Well, well, with two children these days, one can't do more. No, Minnie, I've got it. Here you are, cabbie. None of your ways with me. Come in, Minnie. Oh, I could carry you, let alone your basket. So they go into the dining room. Aren't many children? Slowly the knives and forks sink from the upright. Down they get, Bob and Barbara, hold out hands stiffly, back again to their chairs, staring between the resumed mouthfuls. But this will skip. Ornaments, curtains, trefoil china plate, yellow oblongs of cheese, white squares of biscuit. Skip, oh, but wait. Halfway through luncheon, one of those shivers. Bob stares at her, spoon in mouth. Get on with your pudding, Bob. But Hilda disapproves. 